and craft. And he is, um, he's one of the youngest teachers I ever had. <laughs> he's actually the youngest of 17 siblings. Now that's amazing. And Dick Davis mentioned to me when we came in how Mr. Kraft used to say in class how that he was one of 17, the youngest of 17, and we all marveled. Yes, we did. And he learned the vocation of farming at an early age from his family. He received his bachelor degree from Berea College. Don Lanehart, where are you? Now you've got it. Yeah, Watson graduated from Berea too. And um, he got actually two master's degrees from UK, one in teaching and the other in administration. He began teaching in Mason County, but soon ended up at Hebron High School. And then, of course, in 54, when all our high schools, isn't this funny how history repeats itself? All high schools went together, and we had Poon County High, and now they're all over again. <laughs> So uh, he taught vocational agriculture and physical science. Now I had Mr. Kraft in physical science. I tell you what, he was the best teacher I ever had in high school. He took the whole lot of us out to the, the parking lot and opened the, the trunk or the front end of his car and showed us all the different parts. I had never seen that before and I wouldn't have to till this day but thank you Mr. Kraft for teaching me about the car. I didn't learn to drive till I was 21. <laughs> he met and married his wife Minerva whom many of us also know because she was a school teacher too and then two of his daughters turned out to be uh, school teachers well I say his two daughters and then three of his five grandchildren are also teachers, so it runs in the blood. Mr. Kraft served our country very faithfully during World War II. For that, we'll never be able to thank him enough as well. He was one of those guys who was willing to give it all for his country. And so without any greater uh, discussion on my part, I'm going to call Mr. Watson Kraft to the podium and let him tell us what he has to say. Thank you, Mr. Kraft. Thank you. Thank you very kind. I'm on a row of people back in the back row open here. What about this corner over here? All right. Yeah. <laughs> if I don't speak loud enough, just give me a sign. David, you'll do that. If you don't, I'll get you. <laughs> I'd like to start this off by asking a question of you people. Do you, any of you know of a person in this audience that has talked to a live Johnny Reb, a person in the war between the states. Anybody? I'll hold up my hand, and you now know one. I line run Watson. Archie, then, then do you want to, do you want to, this thing? No, just, just talk into it. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I'll do it my way. <laughs> yes, I, uh, my grandfather was Private Enoch Arden Craig. <coughs> He was one of Morgan's Raiders. The only place that I know that he had participated, of course they were Raiders. They, they stole your horses <laughs> and your cash and your food and anything else that uh, they could use. He was uh, his first foray, we might say, was down south 
through Tennessee and to northern Georgia. Had a little battle there. He was in the battle over here at Santiana. I know that. But he was a private, and I wanted to know what did he do? What, and I never, I used to go by and stop every morning and tie his shoes, put his shoes on it and tie his shoes. He, he was in his 90s and he, he couldn't, he couldn't maneuver those shoes anymore. But he never would tell me what he did. Well, there was a guy back in the mountains uh, by the name of Whitaker that was quite a character. He wrote a little book, a little thin book. And I got a hold of that. I thought that might be a nice little thing, and I, I got a hold of that. And there's a story in there about they, they got a, a, a sheep and slaughtered it, stole it, of course, slaughtered it, hid it, and our cook. Chump Craft cooked it for us. <laughs> so that's how that's how I knew what he did. And then we'll go on down the line. The next one, his father was Preacher Arch, and his father was James, and his father was Archilus. Archilus was a Revolutionary War soldier that fought at Monk's Corner, which is down in, in what's now South Carolina, uh, Kings Mountain, and Kings Mountain actually was the turning point that, uh, that brought the Revolutionary War to an end. And uh, the siege of Charleston. So we have little mean sentence every once in a while. <laughs> I was a 17 year old kid in 1941 when uh, I'd been out playing on the farm this Sunday morning. Came in and my uncle had the only radio in our area and he said we have been attacked. Japanese have attacked the naval forces at uh, Pearl Harbor. Well, I, I didn't know where Pearl Harbor was, but I got a mad with the wet hand. He had no, they had no use to do this. So the next day, I went over and tried to join the Navy. And uh, they told me, well, how old are you? I said, I'm 17. Well, you're not old enough. If you can get your father's permission, my mother passed away, if you'll get your father's permission, we'll take you at 17. Otherwise, you'll have to wait till you're 18. Well, my dad, <laughs> no, no way in the world. I mean, his, his words were, I ain't gonna send one of my boys off to get him killed. Just forget it. And when he said that, that was the end of it. There was no arguing. So I waited a year. Then I joined. I was working in Charleston, West Virginia, and I went down and did all of my preparing. I was ready to go. And they told me that they would call me after my birthday, they called me, and they called me on August the 6th. So I went to Great Lakes, and this is the beginning of the story of Watson Craft as a member of the Sandlance crew. The Sandlance is the only submarine that I participated in war. These others was after the war. San Lance was my home for almost four, four years. But, uh, of course, I had to go through the boot camp, do all that nice stuff. And the last day, I 
was taking my physical examination. They called me in and said, uh, take this envelope, a big, big manila envelope, take this back to your squadron commander. Well, my squadron commander was the chief petty officer. And we saluted them too, you better believe we did. They didn't deserve one. <laughs> but we, 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 along with the hotel doorman, anything that had a piece of gold on it, we just told them. <laughs> we saluted them and went on. So uh, this envelope had a red stamp on it. And on that, that said, physically and mentally qualified for the submarine service or the Naval Air Corps. And I looked at that, gosh, I didn't know that I had that much sense. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there it was. So I went back to my squadron commander. I said, what's this business? About? What's the submarine service? And he just almost stopped in his tracks because he was an ex-submarine man. He said, you interested? And I said, well, I'd like to look at it. I said, it says I'm qualified for it, so I'd like to look at it. So he took me aside. And I got a lecture for about two hours. And it piqued my interest. I didn't, I'd never been out of the sight of the land. I'd never seen a ship. And here I am volunteering through something that I'd never heard of and never seen. So he said, of course, you know that all submarine men are volunteers. Yes, I, I didn't know that. He said, well, you are. No conscripts in the submarine service. I thought about that. I thought, well, you know, this is looking pretty good. So I, I volunteered for it and I signed up for it. Well, I'm just waiting for him to call me. So I don't know, let's call. They were sending me to school. And I didn't want to go to school. I quit school. And so I finally got uh, shipped out to the University of Illinois and I did my work there with, with not with honors but uh, passable <laughs> and they called for submarine volunteers and I'd volunteer I thought I was kind of on a fast track you know well a hundred of us stepped out there there was a hundred of us on on that track they wanted three men. <laughs> so we're going to we're going to get any way they can to get you out of there. You're going to go. So finally, it was down four. Me and another guy. They couldn't. They, they picked number one, number two. There was me and another guy. They couldn't decide on which one else they wanted to take. So this is the way that they determined it. Who, they, who they're going to get. They took us in the swimming pool, and they got a stopwatch, and they soused our head down underwater. And I had sense enough to open my eyes, and I could see that I could see these other people popping up. I thought, brother, if it busts alone. <laughs> I'm going to win this one. And I did. <laughs> so I was shipped out immediately to the submarine school of New London, Connecticut. And there I met what you would see on this thing here somewhere. There's a little patch that says Spritz's Navy. Well, Spritz was Mr. Paul. He ran the, the submarine school at the submarine base in New London. And he was one of the nicest people I ever ran into. Great big fellow. And he patted me on the back and he said, you know, I've got a little job. 
that you could help me out with if you would? Well, sure, of course. So he handed me a, a gallon tin or vegetables or fruit, something shipped into the mess hall. And he said, I want to show you something. So he took me outside, outside the barracks, and cigarette butts and trash all over this area, from this sidewalk to that sidewalk to the street. He said, would you, would you please set up for me and pick that up? Sure. He said, so I'm out there, and that, you're like a little panty hen, I picked it up. <laughs> I guess probably 15 minutes I was finished, and so I went in. I presented it to him, and he thanked me and patted me on the back again. And my car I sold him and handed me that, that bucket. That was my job. That was my job. Well, I found out this chief had told me that I had talked to him first. He says they'll do anything in the world to kick you out. Anything. Uh, you're not going to get this old boy. You put him out, I'll just take him home and pick him up. Well, that didn't work either because uh, that wasn't what he wanted at all. <laughs> he wanted me on the ball. But anyway, I made it through the orientation. I made it through the submarine school. I'm ready to go to sea. And I was shipped to Portland, New Hampshire to board the Sandlands. Now, the Sandlands, ever at World War II submarines were all named after a fish. And you wonder what kind of fish is the sand lance? It was a tiny little fellow, about like my little finger, and he something got after him. He went to the bottom of the ocean to the sand and fanned his tail out and buried himself in the sand. And I said I didn't know it. But I've seen times when I'd like to have gotten the, the sand lance to the one that I was on to make a little hole and bury itself for a while. The sand lance at that time had just been launched. She had no superstructure on her, had no guts. So we started putting the submarine together. Our job was to stand around with a, with a uh, fire extinguisher in our hands. They were welding all over the place. Every time they were welding, they had a person that was ready to put out the fire. And that's what we did. But finally, as you can see on these two things here, the sand lance was uh, commissioned, and our crew was Put together, and I want to say this right now. I pay I, I pay very close attention when I meet a submarine man. I want to know what he knows. I want to know what he can do. You know something? They're the best bunch, and I'm not bragging about myself. But they're the best bunch of people I ever saw. And you don't need to worry about those guys. They'll do their job. Well, everything that was done was done <coughs> to disqualify you. Now, you had to qualify on the submarine. After you went aboard a submarine, you had six months to earn this pin right here. That's the twin dolphins of the submarine service. And I made that one. I tell you, I, 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 when I, I noticed the people that I dealt with. And one of them was a, a petty officer. I think he was a second class petty officer at the time. And I asked him if he would monitor me through my qualifications. He said, love to. His name was Delmar Fritchenberg. Good Irish name. 
one of the finest people I ever saw in my life and the best machinist that I ever saw in my life. So he takes me. Now, what qualification is, if you can imagine this, <clears throat> there are compartments in the submarine. <clears throat> Anything happens, a fire, say a fire, you don't run somewhere, you put the fire out where you are. You are responsible for your, for the compartment that you are in at that time. The first thing, of course, you shoot it off. But everything, we had to draw, he made me draw every single system on that submarine and name them. Every valve, everything on that submarine on, on, in that, that was in that compartment, I had to know if this is damaged, what do you do? Well, you bypass it. And you bypass it, there's steps to, to, to bypass this thing. So we bypass it, we get rid of it, and we go on. So when we came down to the executive officer, took a group of us through, and he, t he tested us in all of these compartments. And when he came, when the captain came, Dutch went, I call him Dutch, not Delmar, Dutch, Switzerland to Dutch. So he's, he went to the captain, and he said, sir, I've got a candidate that's ready for his final. And he said, oh, he thinks he's good, huh? He said, yes, sir, and I do too. <laughs> well, that was a stamp of approval. And by this time, I knew the guy. And I knew if you, if I knew half of what he did, I, I'd run that ship. <laughs> but great man. We went through, bang, 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 and he didn't turn to me, he turned to Dutch, and he said, you did a wonderful job with this young man. Well, so I'm qualified now. Now, qualifications means that <clears throat> I, I have passed the, the qualification examination. It also meant that my pay increased by 50 percent. Now you wonder, well, how come a submarine man got 50 percent more than somebody else did? Well, you thank Theodore Roosevelt, and I'm sure you might have heard of him. He, just, he wrote the first submarine that the United States Navy owned. He was a, a, an officer in 1900. And they got him on board that submarine and took him out into Long Island Sound, which uh, the Thames River, coming from New London, empties into Long Island Sound. They took him down to the bottom. And he wrote his order right on the bottom of, of the Long Island Sound that these guys are doing Dangerous duty, they need to be paid for it. And it was passed by the Congress, and it's still that way. All you have to be is in a war or on a war patrol. So I jumped aboard the Sand Lance. We finished all of our stuff that we you see on these two things here. That's the partying. Our, our, uh, parties for getting the thing underway. And so we got underway. New Year's Eve, 1943, I came through New York Harbor on my way to Panama. Now, just after we left, we, we stayed overnight in, in uh, Panama. And 
just as soon as we started out on the other side, everything was going just fine. And we were meeting a, a convoy, an incoming United States convoy. And so our orders were to go to the bottom, <coughs> lie still, let them pass over us. Well, of course, they were trying their best to find us, but nothing there. We had the top side watch consisted of an officer and three enlisted men. Those three enlisted men were lookouts. <clears throat> well, Some place along the line in our training, they, they'd flash islands and they'd say, well, what is that? Uh, well, it may be an island, it may be a cloud. But they, they tested us on these things. <laughs> on my watch, I, I don't know whether I can tell this or not, on my watch, big tall boy from California and he said uh, land away and the officer of the deck said where well, he gave him a, a bearing and he gave him so much above the horizon big and he said, what is it he said, I think it's Guam. <laughs> well, Guam was about uh, maybe another five or 6,000 miles away. <laughs> but this officer, was a, he, he had made war patrols before, and his father was, a, was an admiral, and he called the captain. And, and I'm an old country boy. I'm stupid, but I, I couldn't hardly hold this. <laughs> I couldn't, this couldn't stop. And he said, uh, Captain, we have a contact bearing 376, believed to be Guam. <laughs> Captain said, we well, take another look at that. He <laughs> said, see what you see. So he looked and he said, it's land. Well, it was a cloud. <laughs> we, we never let him get, he, he, he had a hard time on there. It didn't last long, to be honest with you. But the first war patrol, we got to Pearl Harbor and it had no more training. More training, more training. <clears throat> now you take the crew and you talk, I, I know Calipari's having trouble getting his, his boys to work together. Well, actually, if you can imagine a, a hundred guys off of the farm trying to put a submarine through its paces. Well, you work and you work and you work and you work. And, the captain had set goals for us, this, this ship, from the time the diving alarm sounds until we are at 60 feet, 60, 62 feet was submarine, was uh, periscope depth. And he says, uh, you've got 20 seconds to get that down there. Well, if you don't, you got to do it to know what it is. But I'll tell you, your heart beat it off for you. But we <clears throat> we just pound, 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 day and night. And finally they said, you're ready for war patrol. You're ready to go. <clears throat> Load up and take off. We loaded our torpedoes, 26. We loaded our ammunition. Primarily, we loaded our food. <clears throat> Submarine servers, by the way, is the best food in the Navy. Uh, I'll challenge anybody on that. It's the best there is. And it's available to you. If your captain is a good man, it's available to you anytime you're hungry. You clean up your mess. Now, I think Minerva probably agreed that. Uh, that was pretty good training itself. 
Sometimes you got to clean up your mess. But uh, you don't know, not even the captain knows where you're going. You're given, you're given a sealed envelope. <clears throat> and it's put in a safe until you get outside of the all of the harbor and until your escort has turned you loose and gone back. <clears throat> so ours says uh, Empire. That's, there's only one Empire in the Western. Pacific Ocean, and that was the Japanese Empire. So we started at the Bering Sea, out from the end of the Aleutian Islands. The Japanese captured two of our, two of our, uh, oh, this. All of these things here that you see that we've drawn here. And by the way, this is an illegal. We had to wait 20 years to get this after the war was over. I'm talking about the chart itself. We did that, and that was illegal. But the officers knew we were doing it. The quartermasters did this after each, each watch we would plot where we'd been. We also plotted the ships that we sunk and the tonnage of the ship that we sunk. Well, that's not on the chart anymore because they, we had to wait 20 years to publish that and the captain held on to it for that 20 years. But anyway, a little island called Paramashiro. And this is Pearl Harbor. You can see the, the uh, amount of uh, uh, traffic at Pearl Harbor. Well, here is my first war patrol. This one right here. You see where it goes? The first ship was sunk right at a little island called Paramashiro. And he, he was a, a hard one to get because he had an anchor out in front, an anchor out aft. He was unloading equipment that they'd captured in the Philippines. And we deprived him of his find. <laughs> Put his sheet down. But in the process, we, uh, as ice there, Icebergs, big chunks of ice. And one time we run, we we're using the attack periscope, We've got two periscopes. We've got that scope up, and bang, she hits a piece of ice and it bends. So <laughs> we have a useless periscope now <laughs> because it's keeping, you can't raise the other one because this one is blocking it. But we got him anyway, and then Delmar and his other auxiliarymen took the packing off of that, and they climbed up those shear. Now, I'm, t I'm telling you that we're talking now about temperatures that are 30 and 40 below zero. And they're up on this thing, taking the, pa the, the, the caps off, taking the packing out, and they got that periscope down two feet well, so we could use the other scope and it was an observation scope but we could use it and we did the next one the, the next attack that we made was uh, we would come, the captain would say sometimes if you were the captain of a of a ship I mean, my, he'd ask anyone this you uh, what would you do tonight? <coughs> and he was, but have a chart, and he'd be pointing out the, the configurations. And you know, somebody say, "Well, I, I'd go in, I'd go in that hole right there and stay the night." 
And he said, well, let's go over and take a look. Well, the first time that he did that, he found two of them. We were in there, and two ships came in. And we got one of them, and we, we hit the other one, but we didn't sink it. We got a, 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 a radiogram, of course, all, all, all in code, that uh, we damaged it and it was in such and such place. We went there, there the next morning just at daylight. It had been abandoned, but we wasted another torpedo and put it down. Then we came to another ship we fired three torpedoes at it, and it just kept on going. And we knew, they, the, the, the buck crew knew that they had that one dead, dead to rights. So, Captain said, we'll try another one. He said, I think that's a wooden ship, and I think that's a decoy. So he fired one torpedo, he ran the periscope up as high as it would go, and he shot the t torpedo, and he saw it go right through the middle of it, but he saw it going on to the other side, didn't explode. In other words, it wasn't anything in the middle. So we wasted four torpedoes on that thing. Then we start getting at night, and you can get ready for the one there. The first war patrol, we had airplanes driving us down all day long, all day long. They got, uh, got to be awful, aggravating. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, uh, the captain said, let's just rest, let them go. But it, it was there, I mean, we wasn't much more to get the engine started until which sighted an airplane on the horizon and get out of the way. So we did that. At 10 o'clock at night, we decided we're going to come, we're going to go up. We start up and we hear this pachoo, 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 pachoo. <laughs> and the radio when it was on the sound gear said, uh, contacts. Captain said, where? He said, everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere, that's what he said. Captain said, give me a target, it would help, he said, if I had a target. He said, take a choice. You can't miss. We were right in the middle of a convoy. Big one. And, well, that's, that is a picture that was taken from the periscope You'll see, if you see this, this is my, that, that's, that's the reason for it all. That is the Tetsuda, a Japanese cruiser that attacked Pearl Harbor. Down. One here, one in behind this, one here, this one, and one Right over here in the corner, there's one little flash of fire. He's gone. With six torpedoes. That's what we had. Then you talk about somebody crying about <laughs> losing those four. Now, they weren't idle. They dropped 105 depth charges on us. That night, they, they were mad, very mad. But the fun happened as soon as they, they were gone. We came up, and there was still one there. We start off, and the captain said, "This this was kind of really kind of funny in a way." He says uh, to the to the engineers. <coughs> Give me all you got. Well, that means to give me all the power. 
that you've got. We've got four main engines. We've got an auxiliary engine. Put the auxiliary on charge and give me the power from those four main engines. 5,400, 54,000 horsepower. Well, we're just satchy and long, and that thing is right after us, it's a, it's a, a destroyer right after us. And I'm standing back here on the fan tail of, of the Sandlands, and you talk about a lot, of <coughs> a lot of phosphorescence in the water, and this thing is just splitting, and laying that out. So I'm, I'm reporting him that he's coming, he's gaining on us. And then all of a sudden, we went dead. All stop. Fire in the maneuvering room. <laughs> they had given him just a little bit too much. <laughs> but it, it just, it's, it's just kind of like catching your breath and they had it back on. But the funny thing about it was that destroyer that was chasing us, that thing peeled off and went to the went to the right just as hard as he could go. You wonder why? Well, this Clay Bear fellow, Clay, uh, Clay Blair man that wrote this book right here. Silent Victory, that's the Submariner's Bible from World War II. Every ship that sank a ship is listed in there, and everybody that had anything to do with it except uh, I mean, the, the captains and that kind of thing. But he found out that they thought we were, we were leading them into a trap and they got out of there. They were, <laughs> all they had to do is just keep on going. And we'd have been history. 52, we lost 52 submarines during World War II out of about 250. I might tell you this, it sounds like I'm bragging, but I'm not bragging, it's a, a fact. You can find it in that book there. We were 2% of the naval forces, submarine service was. And that 2%, some 54% of all Japanese shipping that was sunk. That's, that's a good record. Well, we came back in off of this war patrol. We survived their, their depth charges and we came back in off this war patrol refit, train, go again. But it got two weeks in the Royal Hawaiian Hotel and barbed wire fences and all. Some of you people have been showing me some, some of the pictures that you have. I can show you some of mine. You're going to have to remove the barbed wire. It is all over the place. Second War Patrol, we went to the Marianas. The Marianas, right here. And but before I get there, I'm going to tell you another story. Sometime in the last 50, 60 years, I didn't get my medals. So I wrote the Veterans Administration told them I wanted my medals. <laughs> and they sent them to me. And they sent me a letter that said, in this Asiatic Pacific one here, you deserve to wear six battle stars. Six battle stars. And I said, oh boy. They got a they got a loser there. I wasn't in a battle. Not a one. And uh, so I I get a hold of these people and I tell them, hey, look, you know, I wasn't in a battle. And you tell me that I should wear six battle stars. They said, Oh yes, you were. You just didn't know it. 
they told me how many submarines. For example, in the battle, in the second battle of the Philippine Sea, there were 97 submarines deployed. And we had the Japanese Empire every 50 miles we had a submarine. You may not see anything, but you were part of the battle. That's, the, that's what they said. They said, oh no, we know what we're doing. <laughs> so, uh, I would accept that. We were in uh, Marianas, we were running from Guam to Saipan to Tinian, just wherever somebody, and of course na na naval intelligence was good, really, really good. They'd tell us there is a convoy coming in and they'd give us the, the bearings, they'd give us the, 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 the track that he's running Go get him. So we were just running here, there, you know, get one. And that was one of the, one of the best war pros, tonnage-wise, we ever had. And then we came to the, the San Lance came to the, it's Waterloo, it met its Waterloo. After, after the Marianas, we went to uh, Australia, to Perth, Australia in the Indian Ocean. And uh, we refitted there and went to the Salibis Sea, which was uh, Bali. That mean anything to you? Hey, I saw Bali and I didn't care too much for it at all. All I got there was two bombs at 60 feet close enough that we heard them splash in the water. At the very moment that we fired on one of their ships, fired a torpedo, that torpedo stuck in the tube, still running, so we've got a hot torpedo in, in, in the torpedo tube, it was close enough that it actually lifted those beautiful engines I was telling you about. By the way, there were Fairbanks Morris, and they were good ones. But that bomb lifted them off, off of the, they were bolted down to an I-beam, stripped the threads on the bolts. I was holding that thing down there. One propeller wouldn't work. And we've got to go back to Perth, Australia, which is a long, long distance away. One engine, one third speed, and that's what we had. And we had to go through the Lombok Straits, where we called him Lombok Pete. Patrolled that for the Japanese, and he was good. He was really good. But we sneaked by him one more time. And we went to Perth. They're going to fix us. Go to Pearl Harbor. They'll fix you in Pearl Harbor. We can't fix you. So one engine, one third speed. We head out from Australia south. We went down south and east and then back up north. But uh, into Pearl Harbor, and they said, oh yeah, we, that's, that's nothing to us, we'll fix it, we fix it. And Dutch, that I was telling you about, the captain, the first thing the captain told him when they got into, into Pearl Harbor, he says, go over to the dry dock and look at their facilities, the machine shop, and see if they've got the equipment to fix us. And Dutch came back in, the captain says, what about it? He says, there's absolutely no way that she can be fixed. 
with what they've got here. And in the meantime, I got a hold of somebody, some mess cook, dropped a glass jar of peanut butter, and I got the glass. He picked it up and put it back into circulation. I had a sandwich, and I ended up with a little blood. Well, of course, I'm in the, in the hospital, and what happened? Send the sand lance back to Mare Island. And there I am in the hospital. Boy, boy, boy. <clears throat> but she came back out. And I was at Guam at this time. And I had just heckled the squadron commander with a guy by the name of Mike Finno. And he was something else. He was a, a good warrior. And he. Uh, Finally, he said, get out of here. The Baleo needs a quartermaster. Get out of here. So I packed my bag up and I went down. I'm on the USS Baleo. And just as I chunked my seat bag down on the deck, here comes this submarine slithering through the water out there. And I knew it. And I said, what have I done? Well, I knew where she was going to tie up. She was going to tie up alongside another submarine tender. So I took off through this, this uh, submarine tender that we were on the Proteus. And I went over to the, to the Holland. I go up the deck to the Holland to hear my officers coming down, getting ready to come down. Well, they'd like to beat me to death. <laughs> and they called me names that my, 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 my mother wouldn't have been very proud of. <laughs> but, but go get your seat bag. You're going to see this afternoon. And I said, Captain, I'd love to. But I, I've been transferred to the Baleo. And he said, that doesn't make any difference. You're going with me. Come on, let's go. So I went over and I go in, here's this guy, I have to face this guy who just kicked me out in the morning, Captain Fennel. And, and here my captain in to talk with him about business. And he sees me and he says, what in the, are you doing in here? And I sent you out of here to the Baleo. Yes, sir. He said, well, get out of here. What are you doing in here? You're supposed to be down there. The captain says, uh, one moment, sir, please. <laughs> and he told me the circumstances of me being where I was. And he says, he's a quartermaster. I want him. And he says, OK, that's between you and the captain of the Baleo. So he takes me down to the Baleo, and we have to get him out of bed. <laughs> captain out of bed and so he explains to him what he wants to do he wants to see he's never seen me this, this guy's never seen me he says you uh, I don't care he says I, I want to quartermaster he said that make it and of course I, at that time I was a first class seaman you had to be a quartermaster to stand a quartermaster watch so we go, he says, the captain, he said, what's this guy's rate? He says, he's a second class, which meant that he was two step taller than me. He says, uh, you gonna give me a second class for a first class seaman? Yes, he said, good trade, get it done. So I walked up, picked up my sea bag, and went over to the sand last and went back into my, even my bunk. The same one. So at this, uh, this time, the war was over, really. Now, uh, the last, last two warp trolls that I made, really, as you can see, were in the Japanese home islands. 
and they were, we got one ship, and I think it was like about uh, 3,000 tons. Not the big ones, the big fat ones. That's over, that's done. So I, then I made the, uh, the, the, the fifth war patrol. We changed the captain. And if you give me that midway one, I'll uh, give me the. Uh, this would, uh, I tell you, there's only one thing wrong with this picture right here. That's the sand lance. But notice, it says that she's on a war patrol. That's what the picture says. I never saw the number of that submarine on the hull of that submarine. It just didn't happen on war patrol. But uh, that actually, they had reconditioned the, the Sand Lance and gave her to, uh, sold her for $35,000 to uh, uh, Brazil. And she's a Rio Grande Sol. That's the way she ended up as spare parts for other submarines that we'd given them. Uh, give me the one on Midway, the crew. Yeah. I want to know, if Nancy, you recognize this dude here? <laughs> That's Sergeant Schreiber. Sergeant Schreiber was uh, <laughs> one war patrol with us, and he was a my girl. He's running for vice president of the United States, and I said, "I say, but I say over that guy." Oh yeah, Dad, we know, we know, we know. <laughs> well, that's that's the guy. And if you don't believe that. I got a button for him right here. That's his. And we tried to get him to meet with us. And the only thing he wanted to know is how we got his telephone number. <laughs> <laughs> so that was uh, the changing of my captain. My captain was, was uh, Garrison, M.E. Garrison. We called him to his back, main engine. <laughs> And that, that, that was his, his nickname. He was a good one. And he, was, he is the man that married the atomic uh, propulsion system to the submarine. He's the man that, that's where, he, that's where he finished up his work. He was an engineer, a good one. And that's the crew of there. And there's a little guy right in here somewhere that uh, sneaked in there some way or another. I tell you, I'm a quartermaster. Most people don't know what a quartermaster is. And I want to tell you, uh, a lot of the stuff that, it, that Navy does is their old, old sailing ship stuff, okay? A quartermaster is in charge of or capable of communicating visually or steering a ship or plotting a ship's course and it's done all of the all of this kind of stuff is done at the on the quarter deck so therefore I'm a quarter master. I'm master of the quarter thing. Now, third class, and there's the second class, and then the chief. So you got some place to go. That's 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 what a quarter master is. And an army is something else. I don't know unless there's questions. And he pulled that one guy out of there. <laughs> <laughs> had such a hard time, didn't it? Yes, sir. Just, just a little uh, submarine trivia about yourself. You've not told the 
audience what you've had under your scalp all your life. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not <laughs> hearing. Here. What you got under your head? When you push, <laughs> when you push the uh, patch. Oh yes, I. Um, I didn't intend to tell that, but I will. <laughs> uh, we had a, 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 an officer by the name of Crapo, C R A P E A U. He was an All American at the Navy. All of, the only, I'm sorry. The only problem was uh, he didn't do things the way he's supposed to. And there, there's a right way, and there's a Navy way. And you do it the Navy way. And make any difference. You close the hatch with a copper lanyard. It has a copper lanyard. And there are two toggles in that lanyard. That's the quartermaster's job on the submarine, is to close that hatch. Open that hatch. Nobody closes, nobody opens the hatch, but the quartermaster of the watch. Now we had an airplane coming in, and Crepo got excited. And he came down. He grabbed the toggle with one hand. That meant that 18 inches. And uh, we got an order. Leave your station, proceed south at maximum safe speed. Well what's happening. So we get out of there. We're, we're up close. We're at Kyushu Island, up close to Nagasaki, and we leave. The next morning, about 10 o'clock, I went on deck, as I normally did, but about three or four times during my watch, I'd go on deck. And I'd go on deck, and I would help out the after uh, scout that was looking, he had a 180 degree uh, span, both sky and water that he had, he had to cover. And I'd tell him, you take the water, I'll take the sky or vice versa. You choose and I'll take what's left. He says, my eyes are not good this morning. Take the sky. And so I just put my, my uh, binoculars to my eyes. And at that very second, I saw what looked like somebody strike a match. Way in the sky. And immediately, this huge white light light and I report a uh, white light I give it to give it zero 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 that's north exactly north <coughs> and a guy by a guy by the name of Hank Reitman was a guy that I had relieved and so I, I reported this, a bright light, and gave the, the uh, uh, bearing and gave the, the angle above the, the horizon. And the officer of the deck got it with his eyes, but not with his binocular. Of course, nobody, had any, to my knowledge, had any idea what it was. And the captain came up and he questioned me. He relieved me of my watch. I knew there was something. He relieved me of my watch. And he sat down with a man and he started talking about this and he was writing everything down. And he said to me, he says, how, you, you say, it's a, a bright, the brightest light you ever saw. He said, give me something. <clears throat> he said, Tell me something else that I can relate to. I said, it was brighter than the sun because it was a beautiful sunshiny day. I said, it's brighter than the sun. And he said, 
Are you sure? I said, yes, sir. Now, about two or three years ago, National Geographic had an article in there. It was 50 times brighter than the sun. And it was the atomic bomb that, that destroyed Nagasaki. We turned around. Within an hour, we had our orders to go back to where we were. And before we got there, the war was over. Proceed to the nearest friendly port, which for us would have been would have been the Philippines. But uh, we had an exceptionally good engineering officer. Captain said, "Figure out how far we can go on that." And he says, "See if you can make it to Midway." He came up with his calculations, and he said, "We may have to walk the last 50 feet, but we can get to Midway." <laughs> Told us how. Uh, how we had to run. We did. I'm finished. Unless you people want to ask questions, I'll answer them if I can. Uh, I wanted to. Uh, I, I have. I have got a, a gold invitation to go to New London and put the U. That was all. It wasn't just me. All the Kentucky. Uh, World War II veterans, go put the Kentucky in commission. And I did that. And I ran into a bunch of people there and I saw something that, of course, is 10 times bigger than the submarine I was on. But the thing that I wanted to tell you, it will carry, it has 24 silos on it. Each of those missiles in those silos can, can six of them six of them can't hear you oh I'm sorry I forget this thing uh, there's six atomic bombs or, or, or H bombs or whatever you want to use in each one of those in other words the USS Kentucky could destroy over 200 cities the size of Cincinnati. And when they were going through this, I said, if it would do all that, what are you making another one for? And you, you, you've, got, you've got four others under construction over here. And I said, we don't need them. Well, it's, it's an amazing thing to go aboard one of those submarines and realize that they say that the amount of fissionable material the size of a walnut will run that submarine for 20 years. That, that's amazing to me. Yes. When was that commissioned? What year? What year? 90. 90. I think. My, my, I think it was 90. <coughs> yes. When? 90. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very kindly. Ship that's either a water tanker or something like that, and the other one that's a Tatsuda up there with the at the top that's the man of war. That, that's a ship sunk, and it uh, on this morning we had uh, the chart 
We had this tonnage every month of the year. At first, first war patrol, we, we came up with about 68,000 tons of shipping something. Well, thank you again, Mr. Kraft. And we really appreciate your presentation and your service to our country. And um, we will be giving Mr. Kraft uh, several copies of the uh, DVD of his presentation and uh, perhaps uh, one of our, have you already got our Boone County History book? We'll be giving you that, that too. All right, well thank you all very much for coming.